Baptisms. We've been doing this short series on baptisms. And today we're looking at the gift and the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Who is the Holy Spirit? That's, uh, I don't think it's an easy question to answer. When we talk about the Trinity, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, we can conceive and, and imagine what a, a father is like even if it's based on our earthly dads and with all their failings and, and uh, uh, imperfections. But we can imagine what God the Father is like. We can conceive what Jesus the Son is like from the Scriptures and, uh, and how we uh, read about him there. But it's very difficult to visualise what the Spirit is like. There's lots of different descriptions uh, of the Spirit throughout uh, the, the scriptures. So it's a bit hard to put a face uh, to a name. Have you, um, have you ever had that embarrassing situation where you can't put a, uh, a face to a name? Do you want to hear about a situation I had just a couple of weeks ago? Um, I was in Sydney with Pastor Bill and uh, we were getting into a, an elevator and Bill got in ahead of me and there was someone else in the elevator already and Bill is going, oh, you're that, that guy, you're that musician, that, that famous person. But he could not think of the name. And so I was getting in behind him and I said, it's Paul Kelly, that's his name. So, and he was lovely. He chatted with us coming down in the lift. He's actually an Adelaide boy, so, um, so we had a bit of a, a chat with him. Well, we kind of have the opposite problem with the Holy Spirit. Uh, we know the name. Uh, and we can read about the nature of the Holy Spirit through the Scriptures, but it's a bit hard to put a, a face to it. And so today we're talking about the Holy Spirit. Who is the Holy Spirit? Pastor Bill talked last week about being baptised in the Spirit and speaking in tongues, receiving that beautiful prayer language. And on Tuesday night, uh, we had around 40 or 50 or so folks here for our worship night, which was just a, a great time. We had a few of our young people come through uh, in the gift of speaking in tongues, and it was a great time just to, to gather and worship the Lord. But that's just the start of our spiritual life. It's not an event that happens and we just then move on. Life with the Spirit uh, is exciting. There's so much more. And we're going to dig into that a little bit more today. We're going to talk about the person and the works of the Spirit, and particularly around gifts and fruit from two particular passages in the New Testament. And it's my prayer that as we uh, talk about that, as we draw closer to the Holy Spirit, it's going to div diversify your prayer life. It's actually going to enlighten you in certain areas and diversify the way you pray. It's going to strengthen your spiritual life and it's going to draw you closer to Jesus, who is the centre and source of all things. So, who is the Holy Spirit? Well, for starters, he is the third person of the Trinity. The Holy Spirit is a person. Um, you might have noticed there that as Pastor Phil was, was reading that creed, he kept saying the Holy Spirit, but we didn't tell the media guys, so it still said the Holy Ghost on the screen behind him. And that is because at the time that was written, that was a, a common term, the Holy Ghost, but it's not really a very good at, a translation uh, of the word um, in the original scriptures. And so we, we don't want to think of the, the Spirit uh, uh, as you know a mysterious ghost or ghoul like we do today, you know, Ghostbusters. And the Spirit is a person with a personality. And just in the same way that we pray to God the Father and Jesus the Son, you can pray to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was there at the beginning of the world and will be there at the end. It says in Genesis 1 verse 2, second verse of the Bible, the earth was formless and it was empty and darkness covered the deep waters and the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. The Spirit was uh, most closely uh, involved with the creation of the world. And then in Revelation 22, the last chapter of the Bible, 
The last five verses, verse 17, it says, the spirit and the bride, so the bride being Jesus, uh, sorry, the bride being the church of Jesus, the spirit and the bride say, come, let anyone who hears this say, come. Let anyone who is thirsty come. Let anyone who desires drink freely from the water of life. And that whole chapter is a depiction of what it's like as we step from this life into the, the next life in heaven. And so the Spirit was there at the beginning of the world. The Spirit will be there at the end of the world, uh, beckoning us uh, into heaven. The Holy Spirit's evident throughout all of the Old and New Testament. You know, we might think sometimes, oh, it's only sort of really talked about in the New Testament. Um, but actually, the more you, you look through the Old Testament, you see uh, mention of the Spirit, particularly the prophets operating the gift of prophecy. Um, and particularly Isaiah and Ezekiel. Um, but there's also lots of biblical symbols for the Spirit all throughout the Old Testament. Wind, breath, water, oil, fire. Um, whenever you see mentions of that, those are symbols of the work of the, of the Spirit through the Old and New Testament. It's the same Holy Spirit that Jesus encountered and spoke of. So in Luke chapter 3, we read about when Jesus was baptised in water by his cousin, John the Baptist, and, uh, and it says that the Spirit descended on him like a dove. It doesn't say it was a dove. He wasn't being attacked by birds. It wasn't an Alfred Hitchcock film or anything. Um, it says the Spirit came on him like a gentle dove. And then uh, in the following chapter, chapter 4, it says he was led into the desert for 40 days. And, uh, and there again, he just relied on the Spirit to, to nourish him as he was tempted and, and taunted by the devil. Later in um, John chapter 14, as Jesus was preparing to go to the cross and he was talking to his disciples on the night before he died. And he said, guys, in a few hours, you're not going to have me physically with you. But you're going to have the Holy Spirit. And he described the Spirit as a helper comforter, a counsellor, a friend, a truth teller. And it's the same Holy Spirit that we see working through the book of Acts in the New Testament letters. After Jesus had died on a cross, after he was resurrected and ascended to heaven. And, uh, and we read about the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, where they received the Holy Spirit and that personal gift of, of speaking in tongues. We see evidence of spiritual gifts and spiritual fruit all throughout um, the, the rest of the New Testament. And so those are the two things we're going to hone in on and, and talk about today, the gifts of the Spirit and the fruit of the Spirit, because sometimes these all get a bit muddled up and a bit confusing. And I'm going to uh, <laughs> cover a lot of territory today, so strap yourselves in. Um, but uh, we want to differentiate between these two things. What is it that God does through us and what is it that he does in us? Because the gifts of the Spirit, and that's what we're going to start with, is what the Spirit does through us. He operates these gifts through us. If you've got a Bible there, you might want to follow along in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Um, Paul wrote a letter to the church at, at Corinth because they had lost their way. So one of the early church fathers, this is after Jesus' time, um, there's a church established in, in Corinth. I, I suspect from reading through 1 Corinthians, there were spiritual things going on. They were doing church and having services, but um, it had become a bit of a, a sideshow or a circus. It was a bit chaotic. And, uh, and so there were spiritual things happening, but they weren't necessarily of God. Uh, and that happens in churches today too, by the way. Um, you know, there can be some spiritual things going on, but you think, ooh, I don't think that's of Jesus. So Paul writes this letter that was very loving, but it was confronting and correcting to the Corinthian church as well. And he talks about spiritual wisdom. He talks about spiritual living. Uh, he talks about the spiritual gifts, which we're about to look at, and what it really means to be spiritual people. And so in, verse, uh, so in chapter 12, he starts off by saying, he goes, well, look, about spiritual gifts, he says, I don't want you to be misinformed. I don't want you to, to, to misunderstand these, or in some translations it says ignorant. I don't want you to just kind of 
Oh, well, that's something for somebody else. I don't need to know about these. He says, get informed about the spiritual gifts. And then over the next couple of verses, he reminds the Corinthians of where they came from and how they used to worship idols. And he says, don't idolize the gifts. Don't worship the gifts. You worship the gift giver. And so they, they, I suspect they had gotten things out of the balance a little bit and they were just going after, ooh, prophecy, healing. We like that and kind of because, um, you know, it was sort of, they were seeing it a little bit like maybe entertainment. The flip side, he also says, verse 7, he says, hey, don't think that these gifts are not for you. Sometimes we might think, oh, well, that's just for pastors or leaders or someone else. He says, no, no, don't, don't think they're not for you. He says, I want to operate these gifts through you. These are gifts here to help you in your everyday life. And so, um, and so let's have a read now from verse 7. Uh, And I'm going to go through them really quickly, just what they are, and then we're going to talk about each one of them. And this is from the common English version because it's it's a little just a little bit easier to understand. I want to try and take some of the the mystery out out of some of these things. So, verse seven, it says, "The Spirit has given each of us a special way of serving others. Some of us can speak with wisdom, while others speak with knowledge. But these gifts come from the same Spirit. The others." Uh, To others, the Spirit has given great faith or the power to heal the sick or the power to work mighty miracles. Some of us are prophets. Some of us recognise when God's Spirit is present. Others can speak different kinds of languages and still others can tell what these languages mean. But it is the Spirit who does all of this and decides which gifts to give to each of us. And the reason why he's emphasising it was the Spirit that gives all of these gifts was because um, the Spirit does not kind of operate and contradict itself. In fact, we sometimes say this is the Spirit of Jesus. So he's not going to act one way one day and another way the next day. Now, I've got a little graphic up here on, on screen. Have we got that there? This is a, kind of helps break this up a little bit more. And, uh, and so we're going to talk through them. Uh, now, these, Paul doesn't necessarily break these up into these gifts, although interesting, it's, it's consistent with Paul's writing style that uh, he would categorise things and sort of group things together. So, um, so scholars and, and theologians feel that this is a good way of breaking up the gifts so you can understand them a bit better. So in that first column, we have the gifts of revelation. These are gifts that reveal things. So word of wisdom, word of knowledge, and uh, distinguishing between spirits, or it's the one that uh, I read out there before that says recognising when God's presence is uh, there. So... uh, Word of knowledge and word of wisdom, we can get a bit confused over those. A a word of knowledge is when somebody receives supernatural information that they couldn't have otherwise known. And I've seen that operate in in meetings, in our services. Um, You just suddenly, oh, that person over there. Um, You've been looking for something at home. I saw this happen in a a service. You've been looking for something. There's a missing toy and... uh, and this person suddenly in the congregation went, oh, uh, yeah, I have. How did you possibly know that? Nobody else knows that. Um, and then that's quite often then coupled with a word of wisdom, which is supernatural uh, information of what to do in a situation. And so quite often one flows on from the other. And then that distinguishing between spirits. They, they, what this is again, this one's probably a little sounds a bit mysterious, but it's actually discerning what is and is not of God. And sometimes we need that as a gift in split second discernment. You know, we don't have a, a time to go away and, and, and think about it and, and come back. And it's actually a gift that the Spirit gives. I remember Pastor Bill talking about a story one time when a, a person came along to church here. And a very friendly smile on their face was sharing a a bit of a hard luck story. And so Bill's listening to him. And as Bill's listening, this little voice on the inside starts going, lies, 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 
Lies, it was getting louder. Like this voice was eventually shouting, you know, not literally, but he was kind of hearing this on the inside. He's thinking, what's going on? And he very quickly went, okay, I think this person is <laughs> not what uh, uh, they're saying they are. And so Pastor Bill went away and did a little bit of homework and it turned out uh, that, yes, this person was, was not being honest. And so sometimes we need that gift to discern what is and is not of God. And in a moment, when we look at the fruit of the Spirit, that's one way. When you see the fruit operating, by their fruit they will be known, it says in the Scriptures. Um, When you see fruit operating, it's very easy to go, yeah, I think this is of God. I see his love and joy and peace and uh, operating in in that situation, as opposed to, yeah, I don't think I, I see God at work here. So that's the first column the second one the gifts of power these are gifts that do something so uh, gift of faith which is different to saying oh I, I have faith in Jesus I have my faith I believe in Jesus that's a personal faith this is a spe- again a special supernatural ability to believe for the seemingly impossible in a situation and so when faced with difficulty or if you're praying for somebody uh, who is struggling um, then, uh, and I've quite often seen people operate this one, and it comes in uh, conjunction with the next two as well: gifts of healing, which you know might be physical healing, mental healing, emotional or spiritual. Um, and then we have miracles, and you might say, well, healings are miracles as well, aren't they? If that happens, well, they are miraculous, and that's true. But there are other kinds of miracles as well, like provision or answers to prayer. That um, Otherwise, we, we couldn't see happen in our own strength. So these are the gifts of, of, of power. And then the last column, the gifts of utterance. These are gifts that have to be spoken. Or some people call them the gifts of inspiration. They say something. So prophecy is when someone has insight or, or vision uh, into the future supernaturally. Uh, tongues, which is not to be confused with what Pastor Bill talked about last week, the personal prayer language that we all receive uh, when we receive the baptism. Uh, and we, have, we say that's the evidence of being baptised in the Spirit, of speaking in tongues. But this one is a specific gift uh, in public meetings like this one, although we don't really uh, use it a lot in public meetings like this, but I have been in some services. I remember one a um, few years ago now, Pastor David Bland, we were having a, um, like a worship night, and uh, Pastor David Bland got up, and, uh, and he really felt something on his heart, but he just didn't quite have the words in English to <laughs> communicate it. And so he started giving this word in tongues, stepped out way he went and as he's sharing I was going yeah oh yeah okay yeah and, and I could, was actually sensing what it was that he was talking about as he's speaking out and so as soon as he'd finished I said you know what I think the interpretation of that is this because it says in scripture where whenever anybody shares a word in tongues like that there has to be interpretation and so uh, so I straight away I said well you know I think David was was actually sharing this with us and he was nodding as I was going yeah he goes, yeah that's exactly what I was saying <laughs> he just didn't have the words at the time to put into it so that's not to be confused with our personal prayer language and then it's always coupled with that that gift of interpretation of tongues now that's a real crash course in the gifts of the spirit I have <laughs> whipped through those pretty quickly And we're just talking at the moment saying, you know what, we need to dig into these more. We might might do a series on these uh, in more detail uh, at some point because there's so much here to be used in our our personal prayer lives. What is it that God God wants to work through you now? Maybe there's a gift that he wants to give you through someone else. Are you open to that? Now, these gifts are wonderful uh, provisions, and Paul says we should eagerly desire them uh, in the right context of blessing others. He says that in, in chapter 14 of his letter. But before that, he says there's something that's even more important. And in chapter 13, verse 1, he says, If I could speak all the languages of the earth and of angels, so whether it's earthly languages or, or, or tongues, But if I didn't love others, I would just be like a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. 
if I had the gift of prophecy or if I understood all of God's secret plans and possessed all knowledge and if I had such faith I could move mountains but I didn't love others, I would be nothing. He's pretty clear, isn't he? He's saying, desire the gifts, operate them, but if you don't love people, you're missing the point. And this is where we then start to look at the fruit of the Spirit because love is one of the gifts, one of the fruit of the Spirit that Paul talks about. Uh, fruit may not be that exciting. Uh, for example, if somebody came to you and there was a big gift with a bow on it and your name and next to it there was a bowl of fruit, what are you going to go after? You're going to go after the gift, aren't you? It's like, ooh, what's in there? But if you were on a desert island and it was the same choice, I think I'd probably pick the bowl of fruit. Why? Because it's what sustains and nourishes us on a daily basis. As we read the Word, as we spend time in the Spirit, these things start to grow in us. And so it's what we need. And uh, and Paul, in his letter to the Galatians, highlights this in Galatians chapter 5. And he starts off the first few verses talking about the freedom that we have in Christ, freedom from sin, that we are no longer under the law of sin. Um, But what does that look like? How is it that we uh, break away from the old sin life? And so then from verse 16 onwards, he talks about how the Spirit helps us to stay free from sin. And so that's where I'm going to start reading from. Verse 16, he says, So I say, walk by the Spirit. A few weeks ago, we did the series Standing Strong, Standing in the Spirit. Now we're talking about actually walking as you're going through your day, walking with the Spirit. Um, It says, you will not gratify the desires of the flesh if you've got the Spirit in your life. For the flesh desires what's contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They're at conflict with each other. Some Christians, sometimes I feel like they're being pull from from you know all directions and that's because this conflict is very real that goes on in our life even though we might have invited Jesus into our heart and said hey the old sin life is dead sometimes the the temptation is still there and so you can feel like yeah I'm being pulled to pieces here but it says if you're led by the spirit you are not under the law And he goes on, he says, well, the acts and the works of the flesh, those are obvious. And he lists off a whole stack of them. I'm not going to go into those now. But he says, verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, or patience is another way of looking at that one, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against these things, there is no law. Now, I've done a similar little table for the fruit of the Spirit, if we can have a look at that. And uh, again, these are not hard and fast rules, but it's, it's another good little coat hanger, a way of looking at the, the fruit of the Spirit. So the first three there, um, we need those in our relationship when we're relating to God. You know, I talk to some people, they say, yeah, yeah, I believe in in Jesus. But I wonder if they really love Jesus, if they love his cross, if they really understand the the, the full work of of what what has been won for them. Sometimes when I hear them speak, there's not a lot of joy or, or peace in their life. And that's not a criticism, because in the natural, we understand that. But again, here's an opportunity to pray. Oh, Lord, help cultivate this in my life. Be more loving uh, towards you. Help develop that joy, that unspeakable joy and that peace uh, of knowing that you are uh, in charge and in control of all things. You know, quite often when people come forward and they ask me to pray uh, for something and I can see the anxiety on their face and the difficulty that they're going through and I'm thinking, oh my goodness, what am I going to pray? One of the first things I normally go to is like, just pray peace over this situation and that there would be a sense of, okay, we don't know all the details, but we know God's got this in hand. 
And then the middle column there, in response to others, patience. It says patience is a virtue, isn't it? Or um, uh, some translations say long-suffering. I like that word better. Actually, it's a Greek word. In, in, in Greek, it's, it's uh, macrothemia. And when you break that up, you think macro, big, and thumia, like trouble, storms, big trouble. <laughs> and so one, one thing I have observed of, of people over many years is that those who persevere when they're going through difficult times, they come out the end of it so much stronger. Those that, that, that draw in closer to Jesus, again, they might not know all the, the answers and, and, and have the solutions to everything. Um, because in the natural, when we go through tough times, we just want to fall in a heap. <laughs> and, and probably our natural tendency is to, to go away from Jesus. So there's something, there's a quality there when we persevere. Kindness. Man, I'm overwhelmed when I look around this room and I think of some examples uh, of kindness um, and how we show kindness to other people. And goodness. And those are the outward manifestations of the life motivated by Jesus Christ. And then the third one. And these are it's kind of... In response to ourselves is not really uh, the, quite the correct wording. This is, this is more virtues that we cultivate uh, through the discipline of the Spirit. Think again, you know, when you see someone who's faithful or loyal or committed, you think, oh, yeah, I like that quality in that person. They're so faithful. Well, the next one there, gentleness, which is really talking about humility, some translations say meekness. We sort of we think, oh, that's a weak, wishy-washy kind of sound. No, humility is a strength. I'm I'm most impressed when I meet. You know, I've met all sorts of people. Like I said to you, met Paul Kelly in in the elevator. Wow, what a humble guy! He didn't have a big entourage behind him. He was just there in his t-shirt and jeans and kind of chatting to us in the the lift and saying, oh, where are you guys from? And he took an interest in us. That's really humble. He didn't sort of go, just, I'm too good for you guys, I'm not going to talk to you. Humility impresses us. And then the final one, self-control. Um, and you think of that verse of Scripture, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of love, power, and a sound mind, self-control. And so these are virtues that, that we cultivate uh, within ourselves. Again, that's a crash course in the, uh, in the fruit of the Spirit. And I trust there's been something there, one of them that may have been speaking to you this morning and you're going, oh, yeah, maybe there's a deficiency in my life in that area. Let's have a look at the last photo there that I, we've got. We've got that last picture. This is a stained glass window from uh, Christchurch Cathedral in Dublin. About, again, about 200 years old, built in the 1800s. And uh, I don't know if you can quite read it, but uh, it actually depicts the fruit of the Spirit. So if you read the outer circle, you see joy, peace, forgiveness, faith, they're all there. And each of those little circles are depicting different Bible characters and stories. It's just another interesting way of looking at the fruit of the Spirit and being reminded of examples. I've covered a lot of territory today. So, but if you, you don't remember anything else from my message, I want you to remember this. Who is it that's in the center of that window? It's Jesus, the good shepherd, who laid down his life. When we put Jesus at the center, all other things flow uh, out of that. And he is the greatest model. He is the greatest model of these gifts. He is the greatest model of, of the fruit, especially love. And it's the spirit that enables us then to love like Jesus. Jesus wants us to be fruitful. By our fruit, we're known. And in the next verse, after talking about those um, fruit of the spirit, Paul goes on, he says, those who belong to Christ Jesus, they've nailed the passions and desires of the sinful nature, the old life, the works of the flesh, they've nailed those to the cross and they've left them there. 
And I want to say to you this morning, if there are areas of struggle that you feel like keep coming back, if you feel that struggle, um, nail those old desires to the cross. Say, thank you, Jesus, that you died so that I don't have to um, feel the weight of sin. Jesus talked about the fruit of the Spirit in a different way as he was talking to his disciples that night before he died on the cross. He said, remain in me and I will remain in you for a branch cannot produce fruit if it's severed from the vine and you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. Yes, I'm the vine. You're the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. What a wonderful promise. Jesus wants to produce good fruit in all of us. And some of you might be thinking, oh, well, maybe that's not for me. I don't know. No, this is for everybody. He wants us to have access to all those fruit. He wants to see those gifts operating in our lives. They're not mysterious. It's the Spirit that enables those things. And he's given the Holy Spirit to help cultivate that in our lives. What is it that the Spirit wants to do uh, and operate through you today? Maybe there's a gift that God wants to give you. Or as I've shared about those fruit, what is it that, that God wants to grow and develop in your life? I want to lead you uh, in a prayer. And this is an opportunity just to reflect and allow the Spirit to speak to your heart and we're all at different places in our spiritual walk here some of this might be like whoa that is a whole load of information stuff I've never even thought about before others of you God might be putting his finger already on saying yeah you know what this area of your life you need to grow in this you need my help in this and so as we pray now you reach out to God and ask him to reveal what it is let's bow our heads and pray Thank you, Lord. Oh, thank you, Father. You're a good God. Father, we thank you for your son, Jesus, and for, Lord, your centrality in our life, that when we put you at the centre, that all things of life then flow out of that, that you have all things under control even when it doesn't feel that way to us because you understand all things and we thank you Lord that you have given your Holy Spirit we thank you because your Spirit helps us to understand Lord where there's areas in our life where we need revelation thank you for those revelation gifts where there's areas where we need to see your power at work. Thank you, Lord, for faith, for healings, for miracles that you operate by your Spirit. For the moments, Lord, where we, we can't find the words, Lord, thank you for those utterance gifts where you empower and enable us. And Lord, we thank you for the fruit of the Spirit because we know we can't, do those things in our own strength. It's only by the transforming of your Spirit in our lives that changes us, that we start to see those fruit grow. And so Lord, we reach out to you this morning, do a new work in us. As if we submit uh, our hearts humbly and openly to you, Lord, do a work in us. We pray now in Jesus' name. Let's just remain in an attitude of prayer for a few more moments and heads bowed, eyes closed. I really believe the Holy Spirit is speaking to, to many of you now and just putting his, his finger on the area of, of your life that He wants to work in. If there are some of you here, particularly as I've been sharing about the fruit of the Spirit today and you're thinking, you know what? I think there's a, a deficit in my life when it comes to love or joy or peace 
or faithfulness or kindness or patience. In fact, some of you, as I was sharing about patience and long suffering, you're going, yep, I've been through it a long time. Lord, I need your help uh, in that area. If that's you this morning, I just want you to put your hand up. We're going to pray corporately. If you want to see more fruit in your life, yes. Thank you, Lord. If there's an area of your life where you're saying, Lord, help cultivate that faithfulness, self-control. Oh, how we struggle with that one sometimes. Thank you, Lord. Yes. Father, I just pray for those who are reaching out to you in this moment. Holy Spirit, impart something afresh. We thank you that the, this is something that only you can do. It's not something in our own works, but as we respond to you, Lord, you develop these things in our life. Where there, Lord, is a, a, maybe a deficiency of joy or, or peace, May you send your joy and peace abundantly. Lord, where there's been long suffering, Lord, thank you that, that you are helping us persevere. Where there are other struggles, Lord, whether it's self-control or whatever, thank you, Holy Spirit, that you are working on these things right now in each and every situation. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen.